Warning! The following segment may contain spoilers for the most recent Transformers comic books. Okay, so first up this week is Rage of the Dinobots, or as it will be known this week, the Rage of Rob. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's there's so much bad going on here. It's it's not even funny. We should probably we should probably uh, qualify this with that Rob likes to draw, mm-hmm. and um, you know when you're really into drawing, seeing people do it badly just makes you want to tear things. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm one of those obnoxious people who has studied drawing for all these years and but is not actually very good at it. You know, kind of like a film critic, but you know. There is there, it's all in execution, all of it, because we have the problem that everything is done from it. You know, the whole issue focuses on this big fight between Grimlock and Sir Ket, who I'm pretty sure is going to end up being Ripclaw, and it's not done very well at all. Um, the the big thing is every every panel is probably at a it's pulled out a little farther back than the picture of me you're seeing now but not much <laughs> so you are in basically imagine watching well turn on what used to be court tv true tv and look at any shaky cam video of a fist fight that's the quality you're getting here um you can't tell what's going on. There's there is a panel. If you look at the review I posted tformers.com, the sample page I used for the review shows the page I was talking about where to actually figure out that Sir Ket was attacking Grimlock with her tail, I needed the dialogue balloon to tell me. I, I could not figure out that was what was going on. Yeah, I, I agree. I saw the same page and I read the dialogue much sooner than it ever occurred to me. Oh, she's supposed to be hitting him with her tail. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> and you know, it's just it's it's the same it's the same thing all the way through, and I am pretty sure that the big issue is that the artist was really, really pressed for time because if you if you do it at this particular range, it spares you from having to draw an awful lot of hands and feet, mm-hmm. which also costs you clarity of action, which with a book spanning fight scene, you really need. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm picky about these things. Cause like I've said, I've, I've seen, I've read enough books about how to stage, fight scenes i've read enough comics where the fight scenes are crystal clear and easy to follow that yeah this this is that this really needed to be done a lot differently and a lot better the the other the other panel that really kind of exemplifies the problem i have here is there's panel where sir Kit picks up grimlock while she is in dragon mode and takes off with him flies into the air this and is... see, before I read you describing that in the review that you wrote, I had no idea that happened. Oh wow! And I read the book. Uh huh. Yeah, and, and that and that's the thing. That, you know, if he had pulled back just a little bit more, so we could actually see the whole two figures and get and the ground and actually have the other Dinobots there on the ground. Mm-hmm. Because it took me a while to figure out that background was the ground. And yeah, just pull back a little farther, give us a few more figures, give us the, you know, two main full figures that are the action here, and it would all have been clear and it would have looked great. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's almost there, but like I said, he, you know, to 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 pull these Rob Liefeld tricks, he had to be on such, such a really tight schedule. Because nobody wants to be Rob Liefeld. No, n- not even Rob Liefeld wants to be Rob Liefeld. <laughs> and if you look at the first two books in Rage of the Dinobots, I have had some issues with them, but his fight staging, you know, has been pretty clear. I was able to follow everything that was going on in those. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that is a real virtue and a really good thing to do. It's just that here, 
at the biggest, most important fight in the book, yet it all kind of fell apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and to go back to what you were saying about how the artist may have just been really pressed for time, it seems like as the title has gone along, Grimlock's fallen farther and farther off model. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and and again, it's it, it's just another one of those things. He's very obviously trying to draw very angular shapes and very what should be basically precise machined shapes freehand Mm -hmm. and you can do it if you have the time if you're in a hurry it doesn't work no no i mean basically what it feels like grimlock's design through the book has gone through is uh the the uh, generations toy crossed with g1 a little bit down to action master (laughs) pretty much it's yeah. So the the next book I'm is going to be the last one. It's obviously going to be another pretty big fight. I, I'm I'm hoping that he has the time to really do this one right because it could be an interesting and fun fight. But we're going to actually need to know what's going on. That would certainly help. Yes. Okay. So uh, up next we have uh, Spotlight Megatron. mm Hmm. Also known as, boy, this is a cool toy. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so mainly what's going on in this book is Megatron trying to get through to Starscream. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of an odd angle to take when it's not so much kill Starscream for everything he's done wrong, but make Starscream want to be Starscream again. Yes. And it, it's vaguely disturbing how it goes about it, too. Yeah, it, it is. And at the same time, the, the thing I thought was really interesting is we've seen, of course, many takes on the Megatron Starscream relationship over the years. Many of them in disturbing in many different ways. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing I find really kind of interesting in this one is that Starscream's reaction to Megatron is basically... He he sees Megatron as a parental figure. That's what I get from this. Yeah, I would say. You know, well, there's two ways to re- read begging to be punished, and I'd rather go with the slightly less creepy one. I think they might be equally creepy, just in very different ways. Well, true. Or maybe not even very different ways. <laughs> I, I just, never mind. Um <laughs> Uh, but the other part of this seems to tie into the theory that's floating around right now, which is that the spotlights are going to be used as pack-in comics for upcoming toys, which may or may not be based on the primary characters. I think I think it's a sound theory, especially since there's, you know, I don't know that there's that much reason for at this point in the book for Megatron to be a stealth bomber otherwise well that's just what he was rebuilt as in the previous ongoing series in right where this takes place like directly after this comes almost immediately after issue 13 of the previous ongoing series okay it kind of fills a gap between 13 and 14 in the decepticon storyline Okay. I, um, I actually have not read a lot of the stuff that far back. So. Yeah. Uh, so Megatron's been in this body for a long time. When you uh, see him come back in Robots in Disguise, it's the remnants of this body that he's back with. Ah, right. Okay. It's just hard to tell because, you know, most of it's fallen off. Yeah. But, you know, that'll happen. Oh, yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, it really reads, especially... Uh, the vehicular pursuit sequence in the book, it really reads like a toy commercial. Mm-hmm. Which seems... It's very blatant and feels a little bit out of place compared to how the other spotlights were written. Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that. <laughs> I understand. It, it's... Yeah, it, it, it's kind of odd. But taking this in context with Robots in Disguise... Where the story's going right now, this issue feels like a good bridging point between issue uh, 13 and 14 of that series, uh, just to refresh the audience on what the dynamics of this relationship 
is because that seems like it's going to be a very important aspect going forward. Yeah. And for people like you and me who don't really have a lot of the firsthand experience with the background of this continuity, it's really a helpful thing to do. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the art in this? Um, I, I agree with what you said in your view that, you know, sometimes Nick Roche's faf- faces don't quite work. They're, they're just a little bit, yeah. you know, he, he, he draws a couple of very specific faces and they either fit the character or they don't. Yeah. On, on the other hand, I thought that his star scream was really excellent here. It, you know, mm-hmm. it really, but again, like you said, because the writer and the artist are the same person, you know, you, you get a real focus on how this is supposed to play out and what yeah. exactly the emotions are that you might not otherwise get. I mean, you'd have to have really close communication between the writer and the artist to be able to get them on the same note for things like that. Otherwise, yeah. as, I mean, this as long as the writer is a talented artist, which Nick Roche is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it can be conveyed very easily uh, the way it turned out. Uh, but no, I mean, some of the phases just seem so generic. They don't fit the characters. There's a couple of panels where it's like close face shots on Megatron and it just looks like it's Overlord from Last Stand. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it kind of takes you out of the moment because it doesn't look like, it doesn't look like who it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And then, and then there are a couple of panels I thought where he looked very, very much G1 cartoon Megatron, but there's not some, cons- there's not a lot of consistency there in his face in this one. Yeah, that's kind of an odd thing. You know, I mean, all the rest of the art he's done in this book has been great, and, you know, uh, Last Stand w- really stood out for its art style. You mm-hmm. know, those these are the two main things I've seen his work in. Um, but it's just, there's just little bits and pieces here that are taking me out of it a little bit. Yeah, though on the upside, the chase scene works and I can follow it. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's hard to do with, you know, vehicles. Yes. In in static panels. Mm-hmm. In animation, that's easy to pull off. But to represent the motion and the the fluidity of the movement across several still images like that, that that's skill. Yes, indeed. Okay, so finally the book everybody waits for every month, Mm -hmm. uh, issue 13 of More Than Meets the Eye, which, in contrast to last month's issue, was uh, quite upbeat. Yes. And hilarious. Yes. (laughs) So it's basically uh, Lost Light's day off. Or, uh, you know, More Than Meets the Eye, Hot Springs, Planet Tenray. (laughs) (laughs) Um... So Swerve recounts in a letter home about shore leave on planet Hedonia. And are you sensing a pattern with the way they're naming these planets? A little bit. Yeah. And without just telling everything that happens in the issue, it's really hard to summarize the events of the issue because it's uh, like a lot of little vignettes that happen to intersect here and there. But it's just a lot of little, there's a lot of uh, visual gags and like really common storytelling elements, but applied this way, it's really novel and entertaining, especially when they have to roll Magnus, Mm -hmm. literally. (laughs) But yeah, you know, it's one of those things that only a good, a really good writer can do, which is take what could be a completely ordinary situation that told you nothing about anybody and tells you everything Mm -hmm. or at least enough. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's one of the strengths of the way more than meets the eye tells its story where it's removed from the standard war elements, you know, even with robots in disguise, it's still like a cold war situation. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody is living peacefully together, but with more than meets the eye, Except for every once in a while, there's not big conflict going on. And then you get an issue like this where it really is a day off and you just see what these people are doing when they don't have anything else to do. And when you can do that the right way, that 
it gives you so much more about the character than anything else that you can portray them with. Yeah. This may make a sound like a really stupid comparison, but of all the things that this reminded me of, it reminded me of MASH. Just something in about <laughs> something about the way the characters interact and the fact that you can do, you know, drama, you can do comedy, you can do all of it with them in one one place at one time. Cause there are some, you know, there are a few semi-serious scenes at least in the middle of this and, and mm-hmm. the way that they actually the way that they're used to punctuate specific scenes on you know j- just something about the way that felt is especially what reminded me of mash particularly the little bit at the end with the swerve there and so, ultra magnus yeah that was a good scene but yeah. um okay so in this model who's alan alda that is a very good question damn it, i'm not sure an answer <laughs> No, I mean, I've compared more than meets the eye to a TV series before, and with this, a lot of people are picking up on that kind of pattern with it, because this really is the day-off or goof-off issue between dramatic events. Mm -hmm. And we already know from interviews that, you know, right up through issue 16, it's going to be the big heavy plot stuff going from this point. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this really is the almost tropey, uh, you know, let's have fun story before everything all falls apart. Yes. And I can't really complain about it when it's done well, but it's just like they really are writing this like they're plotting out a TV show. And, and clearly more comics so should well. do that. Yeah, it it works. Mm-hmm. It really – it it – it like defies the pattern you expect in comic books, but it does it in such a way that, like you said, more comic books should do it. I don't know why more have not picked up on this before. I, I could give you plenty of very cynical theories, but I, I think the fact is that just it's, you know, co- comic writing has gotten to be a very kind of specialized field. And if from from which good ideas have a very hard time entering or escaping. 